Welcome to a brand new episode of Law and Batting Order. I'm your host, Tony Ilyacostas. Here are some quick hits from the past two weeks. The Harbaugh is over and a Harbaugh triumphed. This year's Super Bowl showcased John Harbaugh and his Baltimore Ravens versus his brother Jim Harbaugh and his San Francisco 49ers. Both teams featured potent defenses, but it was a matter of who would prevail. Amidst a power outage at the Superdome that lasted for 34 minutes, the Ravens never gave up their lead during the game and triumphed with their second Super Bowl win in franchise history. Ravens linebacker Ray Lewis will be retiring with a second ring, and new leader Joe Flacco won the Super Bowl MVP honors. Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we have Falco 2.0. ESPN's Outside the Lines reported this week that Major League Baseball was investigating a health clinic in Miami led by Anthony Bosch for supplying performance-enhancing drugs to numerous baseball players, including Alex Rodriguez, Gio Gonzalez, Nelson Cruz, and Moki Cabrera. If the investigation evolves the way people are suggesting, we could see the biggest drug scandal in Major League Baseball since Balco. Many more details are missing, but certainly this is a situation to keep a close eye on. All hail the King of Seattle, at least for the next seven years. Felix Hernandez has dubbed the nickname King Felix as players bow before him after each and every strikeout. His performance on the mound has led to a significant pay raise. The Mariners will be paying King Felix $175 million for the next seven years. This is to date the largest contract for any starting pitcher in baseball history. While the Mariners are not the hottest team in the AL West, their hope is that King Felix will solidify their rotation for years to come, at least until the day when Seattle returns to the playoffs. Today's Order of the Court will be discussing the business of the NFL. Have you ever dreamt of one day becoming an NFL executive, perhaps more specifically as a GM of your favorite team? We've all had those dreams at one point in our lives, but what does it take to reach that level? To help us take a look at a life of an NFL executive, it is my privilege to interview Ted Sundquist. Mr. Sundquist was a member of the Denver Broncos from 1992 to 2008, where he served numerous positions, beginning as player personnel assistant. He won two Super Bowl rings, uh, he earned two Super Bowl rings as the organization's college scouting director and served as the Broncos GM from 2002 to 2008. And currently, Mr. Sundquist runs the footballeducator.com, which provides great articles on the business of the NFL, along with other related commentary. And uh, Mr. Sundquist is also a very active Twitter follower. All of uh, Mr. Sundquist's information will be down below in the description box. Mr. Sundquist, welcome to Law and Batting Order. How's it going? Uh, it's going great, Tony. I appreciate you having me on and uh, excited about uh, the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Oh, please. Let me tell you, I think my audience is really in for a very good episode tonight, uh, today um, and for whenever anyone sees this episode. Um, but let's start with Super Bowl Sunday. We just wrapped up what I think will go down as one of the most historic Super Bowl games, at least that I've ever witnessed. And maybe it'll go down in the history books as one of the best. Um, you know, the Ravens fought tooth and nail. Then you had that very awkward power outage down in the Superdome, and then everything just turned around for the San Francisco 49ers. But fortunately, the Ravens' D was able to uh, sustain uh, the uh, the 49ers' offense, and they escaped, escaped with a win, and Ray Lewis can finally retire with the second Super Bowl ring. Uh, so what was your uh, take on the whole game? What do you think? Well, I tell you what, Tony, I was excited just for the game to get here because you had the the young athleticism of the San Francisco 49ers, you know, the, the dynamic coaching of Jim Harbaugh and that energy that they've shown all year long throughout the playoffs. And, you know, to switch quarterbacks midseason like they did after Alex Smith went down with injury, Colin Kaepernick comes in and, and really just gives him a different dimension to their offense and, and brought out, I thought, the best in guys like Vernon Davis and, and, and Gore at running back, as, fe- as well as Michael Crabtree at wide receiver. Mm-hmm. And then you shift over to the, the story of the Baltimore Ravens and John Harbaugh and, and his uh, influence on that club, and really more of a veteran-oriented team. You think of the Ravens and you think of Ed Reed and all the great years he's had at safety. Certainly you mentioned Ray Lewis. Yeah. And then Joe Flacco coming on like he has in his – you know, really in his free agent year now, and, and you know, some of the great players that they've had, the, the route they had to take through the playoffs to get by a great Denver team out here where I'm at, and then just, uh, you know, to keep going, defeat uh, New England, get into the Super Bowl. Reminded me a lot of 2005 when the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, came out here and beat us in the <laughs> AFC Championship game, and 
Jerome Bettis had announced his retirement. Uh, you know, big strong arm quarterback as well, and Ben Roethlisberger, and that team kind of rallied around. You know, that whole idea of win one for the bus, so to speak. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I was, I was anticipating this game all along, and, and it didn't let us down, did it? No, no. And actually, let me tell you, the, the whole game from beginning to end was just phenomenal. And as you alluded to, you had two very dynamic coaches. So, uh, um, you know, unfortunately for the 49ers, they just missed. But, uh, of course, congratulations to John Harbaugh and the Ravens on a very successful win. Uh, so let's talk about you. You have a very impressive resume uh, you were with the Broncos from 1992 to 2008 um, as a player personnel assistant to director of scouting and then ultimately general manager of the Broncos. Can you talk about your experience getting into the business of the NFL? Uh, you know, how did you start off as a player personnel assistant and then ultimately climb up the corporate ladder? Well, you know, unlike a lot, a lot of guys that start in the NFL that, you know, perhaps maybe gain an opportunity as a graduate assistant out of college, um, and then get into uh, college uh, coaching and move their way into professional ranks. You know, I actually had an Air Force career for nine years prior to, to really being involved in football, at least at the professional level. Uh, I was an Air Force intelligence officer. I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1984. I uh, was stationed in Berlin, Germany during the Cold War, and when there actually was a wall still up in the uh, in, you know, communist uh, the Soviet Union in, in, in East Germany. Um, were there, Czechoslovakia, Poland. I mean, our, our mission there was was very dynamic, very interesting. Came back and actually coached at the Air Force Academy. Had a chance to coach for my alma mater. And then um, the wall did become to, uh, did start to come down, and uh, the Soviet Union started to crumble. And, and, you know, I had to make a decision from a career standpoint that I want to continue on uh, in the Air Force, or did I want to go ahead and pursue really a passion of mine, which was coaching. And I decided to separate from the Air Force in 1992 with the thoughts of pursuing a coaching career. And one thing led to another. Uh, the Broncos were right up the, you know, um, I-25 here in Colorado. Uh, and uh, one of the coaches at Air Force, uh, you know, encouraged me to give them a call and just see if there was something that I could do to keep myself busy until the opportunity came to, to latch on with a coaching job. And next thing I know, I'm working in the player personnel department. And it was the last year of Dan Reeves' uh, regime, a very long one, a very uh, successful one. And um, but all good things come to an end. And and so I was there for a year and and thought that hey, well, you know, this was a great experience. I'll press on into coaching. And the um, uh, the new regime came in under Wade Phillips and Bob Ferguson, who had come down from the Buffalo Bills and the great teams that they had there. And he encouraged me to stay on, and and uh, one thing kind of led to another, and I was taken under the wings of Jack Elway, who uh, everyone recognizes that name as John's dad, who was in the player personnel department at the time, and a and a guy named Jerry Fry, who had been a longtime coach uh, and had been the head coach at the University of Oregon, and so those two uh, those two guys kind of took me under their wing, began to kind of transition me out of the coaching phase and into player personnel. And uh, when Mike Shanahan took over in uh, 1995, I believe, or 94, right in that uh, time frame, he made me director of college scouting. It was my fourth year in the league, and uh, I think he was um, overall impressed with my organizational skills and, and attention to detail and things like that. And that's really what kind of vaulted me forward in, in, in player personnel. And I, I knew at that point that, hey, my career – in football, if it's to go forward in the National Football League, will be on the personnel side and, and not on the coaching side. And, and so I just kind of put my nose to the grindstone and, and did what I'd always done, which was work hard and, and try to look at things from a different perspective and present uh, numerous uh, solutions to different problems that we had on the personnel side. And, you know, one thing led to another. Opportunity presented itself in 2001. You know, after you become a successful organization, a lot of times other other organizations look back into those teams and 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 try to find guys that could come in and and help them turn their things around. Uh, the Chicago Bears were looking for a general manager at the time, and I made it down to uh, one of the last two finalists. It was myself and Jerry Angelo. Hmm. And Jerry got the job in uh, in uh, '01, and so I thought, well, if this is what I want to do, I better buckle down and get ready because here it comes. And sure enough, in 02, the Atlanta Falcons reached out 
and asked Mr. Bowen if they could interview me for their job when Arthur Blank bought the club. And uh, that was when Pat Bowen said, no, I don't think so. I think I'm going to hire him as my own general manager. So that was a, you know, kind of a condensed version of how I worked my way up. But it was one of those deals where, hey, you just you do the job that you've got at the time as well as you can possibly do it and, and hope that uh, it helps your club win football games and as a, resu- a result of that that you'll get noticed. And certainly the doors opened up right there. Uh, let's take a step back, though. Uh, you you mentioned that when uh, Mike Shanahan came in uh, to Denver, you became the college scouting director. And it was at that point that the uh, Broncos had won back-to-back Super Bowls in 1997 and 1998. So you earned your uh, two Super Bowl rings. Um, so what were the pros and cons at, at, that, at that point, in that uh, point of time when you were uh, the college scouting director? What were the pros and cons of interacting with college and pro athletes and scouting them in an effort to build uh, Super Bowl caliber teams like you had in 1997 and 1998? Well, you know, certainly there's more pros than cons. I mean, you know, meeting young men who have dreamt all their their life, you know, since they were in Pop Warner football all the way through high school and then college and has worked as hard as they had to hopefully one day have an opportunity at a professional career and to know that you have a big, big part in whether or not they realize that dream or not, um, I think is a pro. I mean, I, I, I really enjoy working with young people. I enjoy seeing them pursue their dreams. And, you know, certainly every, every college player that we ever looked at that we evaluated had the dream of one day playing in the National Football League. And so you, you, you took that seriously. I mean, you know, you wanted to make sure that you evaluated them properly, that they got the right look, that you know you were doing uh, your due diligence, paying attention to details, so that you didn't overlook someone that could help you possibly win a championship. You know, some of the cons I would have to say is that you know just trying to sift through the mounds and mounds of information, and you know sometimes knowing that you're going to miss, you're going to miss on a guy. Something's going to be said, uh, something's going to be presented to you that may or may not be uh, truthful. And you'll run into that sometimes because guys are so, you know, intent on making it that every once in a while you might get that player, you might run into that agent that will say what they think you want to hear. And ultimately you make a decision based on wrong information. Mm-hmm. And that can hurt your club. And, and you know, and you just you hate that that, that, that dream is, is so embedded in their brain that they'll do anything to get there, and sometimes that's even to mislead you. That happened very, very rarely. Um, But it did happen every once in a while, and when it did, it was one of those things that, you you know, it was a disappointment. But by and large, to be quite honest with you, dealing with players is a joy, and and I love it. It's a very small window of opportunity for these guys. Uh, Unfortunately, they don't know it when they're going through it. You know, they think they can play forever. Um, But... It is a great opportunity to, to to build relationships, you know, to build an early career. Uh, certainly, financially, it can it can take care of their families, the, the great ones for life, and even for the guys that are just on the roster, you know, it can set them up to catapult them into other areas after their football career is over. That I think the normal you know guy and gal don't get coming out of college. So. Um, you know, to me, that was one of the, the highlights, you know, of, of being in that position that I was in as a director of college scouting, you know, getting a chance to see these guys come out as 22-year-old uh, college graduates and then maybe five, six, seven years down the road um, hang up their, their football cleats and in their helmet and whatnot and still have a whole lifetime ahead of them as a result of what football had given them. Certainly the advantages were immense, so uh, that's great to hear. So let's shift to your position as general manager, and in that capacity, you not only assume the duties of scouting the players, but you sign them to contracts uh, to be members of the Broncos organization. And uh, during your tenure, you selected Brandon Marshall, Jay Cutler, among a plethora of other phenomenal players in the Denver Broncos organization. Uh, So like the other positions that you had in the Broncos organization, what were the advantages and disadvantages of being a general manager of the Broncos? Well, I think one of the advantages certainly is that you have a, a little bit more influence on the, how the team's put together than just the college side. You're involved with both pro and and college um, scouting, and certainly took a much greater role, if not the focal point in free agency. Uh, you're responsible now for the cap and cash management of the club, 
And now instead of just worrying about, you know, getting a good pick in the first round and trying to find a gym in the fourth or fifth round, mm -hmm. you got to make sure that you're taking care of Mr. Boland's money mm -hmm. and that you're managing it correctly both in the short and the long term because mistakes that are made, you know, let's say in 2002 can ripple and reverberate on you in 2005. And, you know, I think that's what catches a lot of young GMs off uh, base sometimes when they first get the job not realizing that, hey, you know, what you do now not only affects the club that you're putting together in this particular season, but it can affect the club that you're putting together two or three years down the road. And so you better make wise decisions, good contractual decisions right now. And and, and I like that. I relish that uh, opportunity and um, made sure that I surrounded myself with good people, knowledgeable people, um, people that would give me good advice. And uh, and certainly make sure that I made the right decisions. Uh, I'm the type of leader that likes input from all angles, and and certainly realize that there's just too much to a professional football team to know everything uh, from every angle. And so you've got to rely on the people that uh, are running your pro department, that are running your college scouting department, that oversee your cap. And and those were those were fun times trying to piece that puzzle together. Some of the disadvantages, well, <clears throat> to be honest with you, in the situation that I was in under Mike Shanahan, you know, he was the head coach, which in most organizations you're going to find a general manager either, either over the head coach or working side by side with him. But he was also the executive vice president of football operations. And so the general manager contractually uh, answered to him from that capacity. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of times that it was extremely challenging as the general manager to bring solutions to various problems that we had in putting the football team together and to speak to the same person who was both the head coach, which is a very emotional position and is a very much a win-now position, as well as trying to speak to the executive vice president of football operations, who should, by the very nature of the title, be overseeing from 30,000 feet the big, broad, long-term uh, picture of the club as well. And so sometimes it became very difficult in bringing information, bringing solutions to problems, trying to present things uh, to Mike when he was trying to wear both hats, and you never really knew which hat he had on at that particular time. <laughs> well, that that sounds like uh, I mean, there there were the challenges, but I'm sure piecing together who you were going to have your quarterback and who you're going to have as your wide receiver that had to have been a lot of fun. I imagine it's like building a jigsaw puzzle, um, but. Uh, as GM, you had to handle a lot of legal issues, and your educational background really didn't gear around uh, anything law-related. In fact, your background is more geared towards business administration. Uh, you never attended law school. Um, but despite not having that legal background, what were some of the legal duties that you had to assume as the Broncos general manager? Was it really solely focused on signing contracts and making sure that the players got paid, or were there other legal tasks that you had to make sure were addressed? Well, probably the, the, the major part of that outside of the contractual portion, but it was tied to it, were uh, grievances that were you know filed by the player on behalf of the union. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if there was an injury grievance or something was going down there, then certainly making sure that you had detailed notes, that you had a very good understanding of the timeline, what was said, when it was said, what was done on behalf of the club, making sure that the club was following all the proper procedures as laid down by the NFL, you know, through the CBA. And there were times where um, a player who may be grieving the, the Broncos and the league regarding a decision that was made to rather release them or not to pay them a particular part of their contract, that I would have to testify on behalf of the club uh, in front of a, um, uh, an, impar you know, an arbitrator. And so from that standpoint, um, that was probably uh, the, the biggest responsibility that I had outside of ensuring that we were you know, operating by the guidelines under the CBA. Now, the great thing is, is that we did have a general counsel mm -hmm. uh, who was not real involved with regards to contracts at the time. Uh, he may be more now with them, but back then w wasn't as much. But management council with the, with the NFL, you know, they've got their lawyers there, and they do a fantastic job in advising us and giving us counsel, uh, us being the individual clubs, with regards to things just like what I'm talking about. Right. And so even though you don't have the law background, 
you have the lawyers in support of you that understand what general managers and football people are having to go through to put together a roster and to deal with the various things um, that uh, come at a club throughout a a 16-game regular season, and even into the playoffs, and even in the off-season, to be quite honest with you. It's a, it's a year-round thing now in dealing with players and their various issues. And, and it was very comforting to know that, hey, you know, even if I don't know something, I've got somebody that I can fall back on that can explain it to me in layman's terms and can ensure that the Broncos are protected from the, from the legal aspect. Sure, certainly, that's a great thing to have, uh, someone who can – break down the legalese into a great uh, plain English. That's what we're that's what we're all about in law school. Um, now, as a GM, and I'm sure you can talk about this uh, when as as a coach, since you had the the experience as a coach at one point in your career. Um, I'm sure as a GM, though, one of your main concerns had to involve player injuries, specifically involving the concussions. And as you're well aware, um, there are about roughly, I think the last number was just around three thousand plus. Uh, former NFL players or the widows of NFL players who are right now uh, suing the NFL in a massive concussion litigation. Uh, There's a massive lawsuit uh, where basically the players are alleging that the NFL acted negligently and not uh, appropriately treating them uh, in terms of their concussions or warning them about the risks of concussions. And, you know, these were players who were concussed and remained in the game and, you know, suffered long-term effects, uh, primarily CTEs and other uh, sort of uh, brain traumatic uh, injuries. So what do you see in terms of the whole litigation panning out? You know, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, Do you see this as an easy win for the players? Have the players, in essence, assumed the risk of playing a violent sport like football? I don't think it's going to be an easy win, and I think whatever the final decision is, there's not going to really be a winner or a loser because, you know, um, football has done a lot for these guys, as I said before, you know, and, and certainly, you know, medical science and some of the studies with regards to concussions have come a long way in a very short period of time. And I think we all who had played the game, coached the game, even going back to my college days in the position that I played, which was fullback in the wishbone, um, you got your bell rung, you're seeing stars, you're, you know, you got cobwebs, just shake it off. All those, you know, various things that they used to tell you that, you know, just, just hang in there. Um, and, and you accepted that as a player, you know, there's a certain, there's a certain degree and unwritten code of toughness that, Hey, you know, it's part of the game. And certainly in the player contract that all NFL players sign, they talk about the risks, the, the physical risks of playing the game, that it is a violent sport and and it, I don't think anybody in their right mind signed that contract without having the understanding that, hey, at any point in time, I could tear an ACL, you know, I could break a, a, a rib, I could separate a shoulder, uh, or I could even be paralyzed, mm-hmm. potentially killed because of the violence of the sport. I think we all understand that. Um, unfortunately, I think as a result of... Uh, you know, more awareness right now, and certainly I think as a result of, um, you know, the popularity of the sport, the money that the sport has made, and the fact that a lot of these players uh, that are involved in this particular litigation, uh, the game has grown immensely since they played in the day. Um, that it is, you know, it, I, I don't want to say that it's a right opportunity because I don't want it to sound as if I'm not uh, respectful of the situation that these players and, and perhaps their widows are in. But I do think that, you know, uh, they see it as an opportunity right now. They're seizing on the fact that concussions are such uh, a, a focal po- point of interest right now for fans, for the media, for players. And, and the league's aware of that, and they're trying to do everything they possibly can. And I just read, I think, uh, yesterday about GE and the NFL and a in a joint effort to try to do more studies uh, with regards to concussions. And I think everything that's come out of this particular issue is all positive. I really do. But I think ultimately, again, um, you know, when taking to court and the NFL having to battle some of their former employees and players and their families, that, that again, there, there can't be a winner or a loser because it really doesn't take away the injury and the negative effects that come from the injury. But hopefully what it will do as we move forward is, is, is force both the union and the league uh, 
um, to be much more aware, and I think they are now with regards to, um, you know, uh, diagnosing concussions on the sideline, making sure that players cannot go back in unless they pass, you know, a certain medical test. Uh, certainly um, after they've been concussed, you know, making sure that they're, um, uh, you know, properly treated throughout the week and not allowed to go back in until everything looks clear and, and then I think also with regards to how the game is played as well as the equipment that it's played with, that, that all of that will will only get better. So uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, it's certainly a very hot topic right now, and it should be. It really should be Absolutely. because it, it it's just a game, and people should not – their lives should in the end not be negatively affected, their families be neg- negatively affected for playing a game. Absolutely, and I, and I think you really touch on a very important point, which is that the NFL, yes, there is the litigation pending right now. It's still in, the, you know, still going on. You know, a bunch of motions are being sent back and forth. But I think it's what you address, which is very important, is the fact that the NFL right now is at least trying to remedy the issue. And uh, like you said, they're going to most likely have neurologists on the sidelines right now to do evaluations of these players. And I think the clearance is the most important part and most important aspect of the whole concussion issue in general. Um, so let's switch to a new topic, which is regarding your book. Uh, I pre-ordered it on Amazon.com, and for all of you out there, I strongly encourage you to pre-order uh, Mr. Sunquist's book. Uh, you have a book coming out that you wrote called Taking Your Team to the Top, How to Build and Manage Great Teams Like the Pros. Uh, what inspired you to write this book, and what does it talk about? Well, you know, I've always been very interested in leadership and team building. I, I, I think it, it's amazing what people can accomplish when they work together. And I don't want to sound cliche-ish. I mean, I, 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 I honestly have always been motivated and inspired by, by team effort uh, versus individual effort. Uh, you know, I think that uh, the best in people and their performance uh, can be maximized when they're working together. And I've always found that sports was the the hot button for me as far as, you know, really enjoying working with teammates, you know, um, having a goal, having a mission, practicing, preparing, you know, going out, putting everything on the line, and then, you know, sometimes succeeding, sometimes failing, and then circling back and giving it another shot, Mm -hmm. you know. Let's review, let's... uh, uh, recognize some of the problems that we've got. Let's see if we can revamp what we're doing and, and, and press forward. And so, you know, as I, I had a chance to kind of step away from football, and I started writing for my uh, um, website, thefootballeducator.com, you know, I realized that a lot of the things that I was writing about from a football aspect were also applicable to the business world, you know, and in politics and in um you know, other areas uh, of, of efforts, um, and that there were always sports analogies that kind of went back and forth, and you'd hear businessmen, you know, talk about sports uh, in their line of, uh, of work, and in vice versa. You know, sports has become such a big business that it's important that everybody's on the same page as well. And so, you know, I thought, hey, I've got, you know, kind of a varied career. I had 16 years in the NFL. I had you know, uh, I was a coach in, in college. I, I had a chance to be an intelligence officer and, and lead a, you know, a group of people over in Berlin, Germany during the Cold War. And I've just seen uh, a number of different aspects with, regarding teamwork. I uh, was a, a bobsledder for four years, um, you know, gunning for the 1988 Winter Olympics. So I was in a different sport that, that took a lot of teamwork, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> But I didn't want to write a book that was just about football. Um, I I wanted to see if I could take the lessons that I'd learned and apply them to other areas. And so I went out and I've interviewed uh, 15, I think, very prominent people in in, um, both business and politics, education, a number of different facets of life, and asked them exactly what, you know, uh, they thought about teamwork and how they applied it in their own uh, careers and then kind of use my stories to intertwine with their stories, and uh, that's how I came up with the book. Awesome, and I cannot wait to read it. And like I said, uh, it's available for pre-order. Uh, it's coming out in June, right? Yes, it is, June 7th. Awesome. June, yeah, so June I'll 7th. be leaving the link uh, down below in the description box so you can pre-order that. Uh, so finally, Mr. Sundquist, uh, what advice would you give to anyone out there watching this episode who wants to pursue a career as an NFL executive? Well, I'll tell you what, this is my advice, and I'll be honest with you, this is at the end of my book, and I, and I truly believe this, that, you know, um, 
there's a lot of glitz and glamour with regards to being involved in the NFL, and I talk to young men all the time that want to be general managers or player personnel directors, and you know, and I think they just see um, the excitement and and the challenge of putting together an NFL team. You know, and certainly fantasy football is kind of. Uh, drawn in a lot of fans that feel like, hey, if I can do it, you know, this way, I can probably do it another level <laughs> as well. And, you know, I I think first and foremost, you got to want to get involved because you like people and that you enjoy working in a team aspect. That you truly care about players, you care about their ability to come in and perform um, at the very highest level that football has to offer, and that they perform and perform well. And and then hopefully get paid you know rather handsomely for it to be quite honest with you. But then that somewhere along the line over their course of time with your club and in their interaction with you as a general manager, uh, that they learn something, that they develop uh, as young men, and that they grow and realize that they really have a responsibility as a current and then a former NFL player because people look up to them um, on and off the field. And and much and, and just as much, you know, later down the life when they've left football, they'll still be a former NFL player, and people will know that, and they'll carry that moniker with them for a long, long time. And if they've learned the right lessons um, in life, and, and again, I know it's a business, and I know it's about winning games, and I know it's about you know making money and this and that, but I but I truly feel like that that's that's the case with any anything, whether you're working for a law firm or or, you know, a construction company or a real estate firm, um, it's still dealing with people. And, and hopefully that you rub off on people in the, in the right manner. So if you, if you want to be a general manager, a front office executive, um, yeah, do it because you have a passion for football, but really do it because you care about people. And awesome. figure, you know, figure out a way that you can rub off on, on the people that you work with. Def- definitely very valuable advice and what better example to hear it from than you. And uh, you have such a decorated uh, resume. Um, actually, I think you had mentioned on Twitter that you were in the process of uh, being interviewed for the Jets GM position. Very unfortunate that you didn't get that job. But uh, I, I really hope that you make it back in the NFL, Mr. Sundquist. You have, uh, I mean, you have made... The Broncos organization is such a successful successful one, and I know that any NFL team that hires you would be would be doing themselves a wonderful job in hiring you because you will do wonders for them. Um, but in the meantime, uh, you will be running FootballEducator.com. Your book is coming out, and I know in, in those avenues, certainly you will succeed. Uh, for our viewers out there, if you want to follow Mr. Sunquist, his Facebook and Twitter pages will be down below in the description box and also the link to pre-order his book. Mr. Sunquist, thank you for being on Law & Batting Order. Tony, I can't thank you enough. appreciate it, and um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll do it again sometime. Oh, please. You're more than welcome to come back. Thank you. That's the show. Leave all your comments down below, and be sure to visit Law & Batting Order at lawandbattingorder.com, as well as on Facebook and Twitter. Take care, guys. Welcome to a brand new episode of Law & Batting Order. I'm your host, Tony Ilyacostas. Here are some quick hits from the past two weeks. The Harbaugh is over and a Harbaugh triumphed. This year's Super Bowl showcased John Harbaugh and his Baltimore Ravens versus his brother Jim Harbaugh and his San Francisco 49ers. Both teams featured potent defenses, but it was a matter of who would prevail. Amidst a power outage at the Superdome that lasted for 34 minutes, the Ravens never gave up their lead during the game and triumphed with their second goal games, at least that I've ever witnessed. And maybe it'll go down in the history books as one of the best. Um, you know, the Ravens fought tooth and nail. Then you had that very awkward power outage 
down in the Superdome, and then everything just turned around for the San Francisco 49ers. But fortunately, the Ravens' D was able to uh, sustain uh, the uh, the 49ers' offense, and they escaped, escaped with a win, and Ray Lewis can finally retire with the second Super Bowl ring. Uh, so what was your uh, take on the whole game? What do you think? Well, I tell you what, Tony, I was excited just for the game to get here because you had the the young athleticism of the San Francisco 49ers, you know, the, the dynamic coaching of Jim Harbaugh and that energy that they've shown all year long throughout the playoffs. And, you know, to switch quarterbacks midseason like they did after Alex Smith went down with injury, Colin Kaepernick comes in. and, and Super Bowl win in franchise history. Ravens linebacker Ray Lewis will be retiring with a second ring, and new leader Joe Flacco won the Super Bowl MVP honors. Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we have Balco 2.0. ESPN's Outside the Lines reported this week that Major League Baseball was investigating a health clinic in Miami led by Anthony Bosch for supplying performance-enhancing drugs to numerous baseball players, including Alex Rodriguez, Gio Gonzalez, Nelson Cruz, and Melky Cabrera. If the investigation evolves the way people are suggesting, we could see the biggest drug scandal in Major League Baseball since Balco. Many more details are missing, but certainly this is a situation to keep a close eye on. All hail the King of Seattle, at least for the next seven years. Felix Hernandez has dubbed the nickname King Felix as players bow before him after each and every strikeout. His performance on the mound has led to a significant pay raise. The Mariners will be paying King Felix $175 million for the next seven years. This is to date the largest contract for any starting pitcher in baseball history. While the Mariners are not the hottest team in the AL West, their hope is that King Felix will solidify their rotation for years to come, at least until the day when Seattle returns to the playoffs. Today's Order of the Court will be discussing the business of the NFL. Have you ever dreamt of one day becoming an NFL executive, perhaps more specifically as a GM of your favorite team? We've all had those dreams at one point in our lives, but what does it take to reach that level? To help us take a look at a life of an NFL executive, it is my privilege to interview Ted Sunquist. Mr. Sunquist was a member of the Denver Broncos from 1992 to 2008, where he served numerous positions, beginning as player personnel assistant. He won two Super Bowl rings, uh, he earned two Super Bowl rings as the organization's college scouting director and served as the Broncos GM from 2002 to 2008. And currently, Mr. Sunquist runs the footballeducator.com which provides great articles on the business of the NFL, along with other related commentary. And uh, Mr. Sunquist is also a very active Twitter follower. All of uh, Mr. Sunquist's information will be down below in the description box. Mr. Sunquist, welcome to Law and Batting Order. How's it going? Uh, it's going great, Tony. I appreciate you having me on and uh, excited about uh, the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Oh, please. Let me tell you, I think my audience is really in for a very good episode tonight, uh, today um, and for whenever anyone sees this episode. Um, but let's start with Super Bowl Sunday. We just wrapped up what I think will go down as one of the most historic Super 